evening, everyone. My name's John Davis. I'm director of the Mile End Group, and this represents our 98th meeting. Before we begin, I'd like to say a very warm thank you to our long-time collaborators, or we can say conspirators, Hewlett-Packard, um, the City of London Corporation, and Queen Mary's very own School of Economics and Finance. Tonight, we have the next in our Treasury Mile End Group series. The first one saw our visiting professor, Sir Nick McPherson, talk about how, uh, for those of us who are rooted in the present, um, and then he went on to speak about the, six, the 1660s. Uh, I don't think we're going quite as far back tonight. Um, tonight, we have the Euro, the 10th anniversary of the assessment of the five economic tests. I give you the Chief Economic Advisor to the Treasury, Dave Ramsden. Thank you, John, and thank you uh, to all of you for um, coming this evening. It really is an honour to be giving the latest in the series of the Mile End Treasury Talks on the UK's decision not to join EMU to mark the 10th anniversary of that decision. Um, there, are, there are at least three other relevant anniversaries that I think I should mention. The first is the 10th anniversary of the Mile End Group, which is fast approaching. Next year will be the 50th birthday of the Government Economic Service. And as head of the GES, my talk follows a path mixing contemporary history and economics, trodden much more expertly by the GES's first head, Sir Alec Cancross. And third, as David Marsh reminded me recently, 2014 will also see the 25th anniversary of the Delors Report, which in 1989 set out the blueprint for EMU, which itself began in 1999. This talk is based on my memories, and as I didn't keep a diary, uh, it risks all the pitfalls of contemporary history, and it's a personal view with all the pitfalls and caveats that implies. In the audience are a number of my former line managers, and one of them, I think, was the first person to, to describe my delivery as prolix. Um, but with that in mind, I am going to stick very closely to my text, but I hope um, I can bring the words to life, and also that my uh, slides will, uh, will illuminate proceedings. My focus is on the Treasury rather than on the more often told story of the politics. And I'm going to talk quite a lot about process and how this interacted with the policy and the five tests analysis. And then in the second part of my talk, I want to revisit the work we did in the light of development since. Um, there is a theme of Treasury control um, which was covered more broadly in Nick's talk, in, in my talk. And for today, I'm interested in a particular type of control relating to the stewardship and development of the macroeconomic framework and as determined by the currency choices that have been made. This chart shows the chequered history of the dollar sterling exchange rate since 1990. The Labour government's decision not to join the euro and Gordon Brown's leadership of that issue has been seen to be borne out by subsequent events. My conclusion will be the Treasury contributed to this success because of its con increasing control of proceedings. But there were issues we missed and the Treasury is continuing to learn the lessons of the post-2003 period. The lessons from the UK's 1925 decision to rejoin the gold standard and the parallels with the 1948, 1967, 1960, 1990 decisions on currency made by the four chancellors here, Churchill, Dalton, Callaghan and Major, was the subject of a lecture by Ed Balls back in December 2002 in honour of Alec Cairncross. And Ed concluded thus... And I particularly highlighted, um, because I'll come back to this, that as Prime Minister Tony Blair said, the five tests are not window dressing for political appearances. In a 1987 interview cited by Peter 
Hennessy in Whitehall, John Hunt, the former Cabinet Secretary, set out how far the Treasury had lost control in the post-war period. I've highlighted a couple of key bits in the slide. Both the notion of us as a, a coordinator as well as an economic department, and then the way that uh, power had to be spread around government. The first section of my talk starts as the UK left the ERM in September 1992, which shocked rather than awed the Treasury. Speaking in 2002, Terry Burns said this, finishing, but there we were. My task was to improve management of the Treasury and rebuild economic policy. This slide shows the scale of the challenge. Growth was low, inflation, the red line had been high, and the exchange rate, the blue line, was falling. In parallel, EU developments demanded intense engagement. The 1989 Delors report set out the next step in EU integration, a single currency area permanently linking together the countries of the EU, a big advance on the ERM, plus a single monetary policy, a single interest rate for the whole area, and set by a European Central Bank. So, so implying and setting out a seeding of sovereignty over key areas of policy. Politics was a key EU driver, and the euro was legislated into existence in the Maastricht Treaty in 1991. Because of Prime Minister Major's opt-out, the UK did not have to join the euro, but its, its um, development still created a huge political and policy issue for the UK. The Conservative government's policy was wait and see on EMU. Assuming it went ahead, a euro of even a few members would be the UK's biggest trading partner. Having failed to persuade its partners to go down alternative routes, such as the hard echo, the Treasury worked for a successful EMU. An early example was Ken Clark's contribution to saving the ERM in 1993, and the EU's monetary Policy Commi Monetary Committee, which spearheaded the work to establish EMU, was chaired at key times by the Treasury's Nigel Wicks. But the Treasury couldn't get ahead of the government. Answers to parliamentary questions could say there were no staff working full-time on EMU. Instead, the Treasury created X2, a cross-cutting group of staff, each working part-time, which, when it met in physical form, filled one of the large conference rooms in the old Parliament Street Treasury building. X2 considered every policy development and what it might mean for the UK. 1996 was a particularly busy year. With a view to the upcoming election, the government firmed up its policy that April by committing to hold a referendum if the government recommended entry, and the Labour Party followed suit quickly. There was lots of UK parliamentary action involving Ken Clark to ratify key parts of the EMU architecture. Anthony Selden's biography of John Major describes the cabinet discussions in late 1996 to further clarify the government's position. The last cabinet on 19th of December commissioned further treasury work. That was not the last Christmas to be um, upset by the euro. Our paper looked into various possible EMUs, sticking pretty closely to the Maastricht criteria, which were convergence of inflation, interest rates, deficits, debt, and exchange rates within the ERM, and identified possible membership groupings. Following the uh, Cabinet discussion on 23rd January, the government's press statement um, is shown on this slide. In February that year, Gordon Brown set out the Labour Party's position while on a trip to the US, the first appearance of the five British economic tests. So while the Conservative Party's economic hurdle related more to EMU performance, the Labour Party, Party spelt out that a decision on membership would be conditional on the five tests being met. The folklore became that the five tests were invented in the back of a New York taxi, an example of the window dressing charge that dogged the policy that, that Tony Blair had spoken of. The five tests were actually based on long-established economics relating to optimal currency area theory, made more relevant in a pamphlet Balls wrote in December 1992. And they actually framed exactly the sort of assessment of the pros captured 
by the investment and city tests and the investment city and job tests and the cons covered by convergence and flexibility that Alec Cairncross, as far back as 1996, had been saying had been missing from previous currency episodes in the 20th century. And our internal economic work had also been going in this direction. So here are the five tests, convergence, flexibility, investment, the city, and the jobs test. And a crucial advantage of the five tests was, or indeed any number of tests, to be honest, and when you read the assessment itself, you'll see that we added lots of uh, supplementary questions to the main tests. But there was, they enabled us to look at real variables rather than the nominal variables of the Maastricht Treaty. And they enabled us to look at the macroeconomic implications of the required adjustments in markets at the micro level. By um, 1997, the UK economy was growing steadily. Inflation, the deficit, and interest rates were well down from their peaks. And sterling was stable. Employment and house prices were barely back to their pre-recession levels of 1990. But nevertheless, Terry Burns, Alan Budd, the chief economic advisor, and the rest of Treasury officialdom had achieved much of what they set out to after exit from the ERM. The new Labour government's May 1990 decision, 1997 decision to give operational independence to the Bank of England was designed to entrench this macroeconomic stability and credibility. If successful, this offered the UK economy a credible alternative future to Euro membership. At the same time, it was evident that EMU was going to start on the revised start date of 1st January 1999, with as many as 11 members. EMU was a historic project that many in the Labour, part, Labour government, and indeed elsewhere, wanted to be part of, supported by private sector voices such as Adair Turner. The Treasury did a huge amount of contingency work, and immediately post-election, had in place its first full-time EMU policy team, whose priority was to prepare a five-test assessment. Over the summer of 1997, there was no policy announcement on EMU and an intense speculation, but this ended in October. Gordon Brown gave an interview to the Times and his press advisor, Charlie Whelan, reportedly briefed journalists from the Red Lion that the interview indica indicated the government was going to decide against early entry to EMU. I was introduced to Whelan as I passed through the red line en route to paternity leave. <laughs> the EMU decision was announced on Monday 27th of October. The October 1997 five-test assessment document covered all the economic issues in less than 40 pages, concluding that joining EMU undoubtedly has the potential to enhance both growth and employment prospects, provided the UK economy is in a state to be able to meet the challenges that membership will bring but it also judged neither flexibility nor convergence are sufficient at present to make joining in the near future desirable. The slide repeats Gordon Brown's statement to Parliament with some key bits highlighted. The emphasis on a successful currency, clear and unambiguous, which turned out to be a high hurdle, and the timing early in the next Parliament. So the policy was prepare and decide, and the outcome wasn't seen as a surprise at the time. But the approach also drove the timing, the when, and the next EMU decision wasn't taken until June 2003, over five and a half years later. EMU's momentum avoided prepare and decide, becoming, which was the government's policy, becoming a more drawn out version of wait, wait and see, the previous government's policy. The Euro start was formally agreed to under Britain's EU presidency in May 1998, the proceedings featured some particularly pro-European speeches by Gordon Brown. The UK presidency also set up the Cardiff process, first EU-wide member state process to improve the supply side. The euro itself began on 1st of January 1999 with 11 members who would introduce euro notes and coins on the 1st of January 2002. And the UK's first draft national changeover plan was released in February 1999, the work of the Treasury. Over this period, the evolution of fiscal policy frameworks was probably the most significant new challenge. The UK had developed its own fiscal rules, which took account of the cycle and which were seen as delivering fiscal sustainability. The UK was by then recording 
a fiscal surplus, those bars in the middle of the chart below the zero line. While the EU Stability and Growth Pact was taking shape, we in the Treasury saw it as having less economic underpinning. I recall Andrew Turnbull, by then Permanent Secretary, and Gus O'Donnell both commissioning assessments of the implications. By early 2001, the UK economy was performing well, but indeed better than it had for decades on some assessments, with growth up, um, the, the black line, and inflation, the red line in the chart, down. Um, the IMF, in their Article 4 statement were of that February, were very complimentary. But they went on to give the sort of running commentary that we were at pains to avoid, saying, apart from the exchange rate issue, the staff note that cyclical synchronisation had strengthened in 1999 to 2000. UK economic officialdom always keeps a close eye on sterling, but public comment is relatively rare. Bill Keegan, among others, highlights Bank of England Governor Eddie George's unusually avert reference in his June 2001 Mansion House speech. Quotes, most people agree that sterling's exchange rate on entry to the euro would need to be substantially lower than our present rate, which few would regard as sustainable in the medium and longer term. The October 1997 EMU policy was unchanged right into 2001, and this unusual policy st stability reflected political discipline, underpinned by the Treasury taking on economic ministry, delivery and coordination functions, increasingly at odds, I think, with John Hunt's earlier emphasis. Again, there was pre-election speculation in 2001 on timing and intentions. Such was the policy stability that when the Prime Minister responded to William Hague at PMQs on the 7th of February 2001 by saying that for, for the decision on EMU entry, quotes, early in the next parliament, of course means in two years, it counted as a major policy development. Gordon Brown's strategic contribution at the time was to highlight repeatedly the five test work would be rigorous and comprehensive, a technocratic signal of the latest possible timing in this two-year window. We already had a vision of a budget sized, which in those days, those pre-2010 days meant 250 pages of five test assessment with technical supporting material. And there's a picture of a rather, the rather battered box set. Following that, there was a sequence of carefully crafted statements which set out the process for doing the EMU work. This quote from Gordon Brown's June 2001 Mansion House speech gives a sense of the relentless internal logic. I should really try and do this in, in an accent, but I'll just read it out. Um, before any assessment is started, we must continue to do the necessary preliminary work for our analysis, technical work that is necessary to allow us to undertake the assessment within the two years, as we promised. This meant that in answering questions on the timing of the EMU decision, we could say the assessment couldn't start until this necessary preliminary and technical work was complete. This phase also served three other important purposes. First, to give us time to ensure that the analysis really was comprehensive. By the end, we had a total of 18 studies in the box set, supporting different elements of the five test. Second, to ensure sufficient rigor was, it was difficult because of the unprecedented nature of the exercise we were engaged in. Only Sweden had a similarly comprehensive approach to assessing membership, but that was based on different criteria. There were genuine differences of view among economists, as you'd expect, but although pressure groups were established, there weren't many incentives for research in this area. As early as 2000, we had identified issues with Treasury capacity, and the preliminary and technical work enabled us to engage with lots of external ex economists to solve the problem. Many of these would score highly on the new research excellence framework for impact. But I only have time to mention one. Peter Westaway, who came on secondment from the Bank of England for 18 months to fill a gap in our modelling cap capability. He authored two of the most influential studies on the transition to EMU and adjustment within it. The third benefit of the preliminary and technical work was enable us to plan and manage the work strategically. EMU-related work had been used to pioneer project planning techniques from the 90s in the Treasury. And by 2001, we had a programme board, chaired by Gus O'Donnell, then by John, 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 John Cunliffe, 
Sue Owen, not Sue O. Owen, but Sue Owen returned from Washington to be the director with management oversight for the whole programme, taking over from Jonathan Taylor. And you can work out which of them described me as prolix. Um, the board recognised that logistics and delivery was going to be crucial and resourced accordingly. And at the peak of the work, we had 25 people now full-time on EMU, plus those on preparations, with more than 100 others involved to some degree. Through 2002, we were developing the 18 studies, planning for the assessment itself, and making logistic plans for a budget-type event with a minimum of five weeks' notice. To give a taster of the demands, this slide reproduces a bit of the 16th of December EMU Christmas reading submission. In parallel to this, we put up early advice on the related domestic policy issues. So that was a Christmas holiday well and truly ruined, <laughs> and the end to an unrelenting year on EMU. All this material was submitted to Ed Balls, Mark Bowman, the Chancellor's Principal Private Secretary, and Programme Board members. This reflected Ball's centrality to the work in his role as Chief Economic Advisor. Meanwhile, the economy had continued to grow with low inflation and sterling was now above three Deutschmarks on the pre-EMU exchange rate. From the start of 2003, our focus changed to our key stakeholders, who were the Prime Minister and his close officials and advisors, particularly Jeremy Hayward, Stephen Wall and Jonathan Powell. There had been various discussions between Blair and Brown in late 2002. My involvement was through a programme of seminars, which were, were Treasury brainchild liaising with Hayward. Before each seminar, the relevant studies were sent over. The seminar itself started with me presenting the findings and what they meant for the tests. And then this was reinforced by the Chancellor, who gave his thoughts on the accompanying policy options. With the invasion of Iraq becoming ever more likely, the seminars didn't always take place on schedule, but they did happen. The Prime Minister seemed engaged during the seminars, at least to me, and Stephen Wall reports there was a real debate on the issues. I later learned third, third hand that my approach to the seminars earned me the nickname, the man in the white coat. At this point, five weeks' notice had been given by the Chancellor, and we were working towards a budget day announcement on the 9th of April 2003, if the political and policy decision was made to do so. It was a draining time for everyone involved. At the end of March, our schedule required we print 2,000 copies of the 18 supporting studies, around 4 million pages in total. The preliminary and technical phase now was well and truly o over, even we conceded that. And the work on the assessment document had begun. Nick McPherson played devil's advocate, reading an early draft with fresh eyes. And Gus O'Donnell, as permanent secretary, signed off on the Treasury assessment, which I submitted to the Chancellor on 31st March. Our conclusion was that the five tests had not been met and a clear and unambiguous case for joining EMU had not been made. I presented our findings to the Prime Minister and Chancellor at the last of the seminars on the Tuesday, the 1st of April, and then returned to the Treasury, where we worked on keeping open the 9th of April option. For this, we needed finalised assessment language, and movement came at a Hayward Bulls meeting in the Treasury on the evening of Thursday, 3rd of April. I joined them inter intermittently, and then was given my marching orders to head down to join colleagues at the printers on the Woolworth Road at about 1am for what became an all-nighter, as we called them in, called them in in the Treasury in those days, to, describe the, to transcribe the agreed comments into the printer's proof of the document. The new version was delivered to various addresses at 7.30am in the morning. That Friday, when uh, any remaining hopes of a 9th of April launch receded, objectively this was obvious as Iraq and other issues well above our pay grade had intervened. But in the delivery-focused world, it came as a bit of a shock to the Treasury team. The Chancellor told us formally on the Saturday morning that we would have to delay. All the work of the EMU team came to a sudden stop. But the 2003 budget, which, we, which the EMU assessment was meant to be attached to, minus nearly all, but not all, of the EMU-related material, still had to be delivered. The 2,000 sets of studies were locked up in a large cage at the printers, either for their own safekeeping or for the or to keep the printers safe. I was never quite clear which. The EMU team had a collective breather over Easter. 
On return, we made further changes and updates, and during May, the Prime Minister and Chancellor agreed the final language of the assessment. A process was also agreed and endorsed by Cabinet for the period up to the parliamentary announcement set for Monday 9th of June. To, to quell talk of divisions, of, um, to, quell, to quell talk of divisions, there was a joint number 10, number 11 statement setting out their united front on 16th of May. First the studies and then the assessment were shared with members of the cabinet bilaterally in the second half of May. And there was a meeting of the full cabinet to agree the policy in the week before the 9th of June announcement. Although lots of progress had been made, only one of the five tests, the city test, was passed unconditionally. The two key ones, convergence and flexibility, were failed and the investment and jobs tests were passed conditional on passing convergence and flexibility. <laughs> the clearance process left the language quite convoluted in places, but the concluding para paragraph, an earlier version of which I'd read out at the last number 10 seminar on the 1st of April, was clear enough. I, I'll leave you to read that, I think. The assessment and the accompanying parliamentary statement contained a raft of policy requirements, such as the move from RPIX to an HICP inflation target, which, whatever else it did, and there was quite a lot of resistance at the time to the move, at least saved us and the MPC from embarrassment with the subsequent disclosures about the inadequ inadequacies of RP RPI and all its variances. All these, all these policies made sense in their own right, but also increased the chances that the five tests would be assessed to be met in future. There was a further policy commitment to review annually at budget time, quotes, the reform agenda of concrete and practical steps to address, to address the policy requirements identified by the five tests assessment. The extensive analytical and policy contents of the assessment, 18 studies, and the Chancellor's statement and all the, all the policy announcements provided something for everyone, as this slide of various press reports gives a flavour of. Most agreed it was a weighty contribution and comparisons were drawn with other recent government publications such as the so-called dodgy dossier. If you can read that, it says, I like his refusal to sex it up. Um, we had a major stakeholder engagement plan, the roadshow, for getting our message across. The domestic side and much of the work of the EMU team petered out quickly for various reasons, but the international part, led by Sue Owen and others, continued. The slides show some of the institutions we visited. Everyone engaged with us and seemed to find the analysis interesting, but my sense was the majority of our EU partners thought it was of limited relevance to them. This could either be because it just didn't apply to them economically, as shown by this chart of bond deals the very low level of bond yields and their convergence showed how some countries had already, already benefited hugely from EMU membership. Or it may have been because they thought that the UK was making a political decision, a version of the window dressing argument. In the second part of my talk, and with the benefit of 10 years of hindsight, I now want to cover what went well and what went less well. It's an obvious point, but subsequent developments do bear out much of the analysis of the UK's decision not to join. Another obvious point worth stressing is that many of these developments in the Euro have been very unwelcome. Starting with the key convergence and flexibility tests, I think this is where our analysis was strongest. We built up a clear and rounded picture of the dif different elements of economic life for a country in Euro, in, in, in EMU, based on a range of analytical approaches and models. The assessment noted that a decision to join EMU in the wrong way at the wrong time could have long-lasting adverse effects on the economy. And it stressed the risk that insufficient convergence in, in economic conditions across countries might mean that the interest rates set by the ECB would be problematic. In particular, it highlighted differences in housing markets and the degree of economic development could be exacerbated by a common interest rate. A strong insight from Peter Westerway's analysis was to apply the Vixel effect. If inflation is higher, real interest rates are lower, and credit growth and related economic activity, such as housing-related activity, is stronger, at least in the short term. Another finding was that adjustment in EMU is different. More specifically, quotes, inside EMU, inflation and competitiveness have to take the strain of adjustment 
previously undertaken outside EMU by an independent monetary policy and the nominal exchange rate. Rated, related to this, the assessment highlighted that flexibility is, a, is crucial in allowing resources to be reallocated more rapidly to mitigate the effects of a shock. Now, putting on my metaphorical white coat, we applied these insights to modelling the adjustment paths to different shocks, including the shock of entry. We then went further and in the assessment itself modelled the what if the UK had joined EMU in 1999. And these charts show for the fictional UK, and we never had this technology in the number 10 seminars, um, the, but that's the dark line in each panel, how joining EMU in 1999 would have meant lower interest rates and a lower exchange rate than actually occurred, which is the light line. This would have given an initial boost to GDP, that's GDP, um, which increases inflation, depresses um, the real interest rate, and then whilst that boosts growth further temporarily, the depressing effects of higher inflation on real incomes and the higher real exchange rate kick in. This dampens competitiveness and our earnings from trade, although it has to be said the jury is still out on the impact of large exchange rate movements on, U on UK activity. This cycle in the real economy that you, you would see created is only avoidable with a very high degree of flexibility. It played out in a number of economies. A 2013 policy brief published by the European Commission echoes our analysis of 10 years earlier. The, this chart of development since shows that through a combination of lack of convergence of structures, lack of flexibility of markets or both, the competitiveness of Euro members, as measured by real unit labour costs here, diverged, with nearly all economies losing ground relative to Germany, which scored well, and increasingly well, on convergence and flexibility. We didn't go on to develop this analysis to look at the risk to the balance of payments. The analytical consensus was that within Euro, the Euro, current accounts no longer really mattered. But even within a single currency area, if a country has competitiveness problems, this will show up as a current account deficit. And you can see Spain and Italy below the zero line there, and Germany running very huge, uh, very large and increasing surpluses since the start of the euro. And that will make them reliant, the deficit countries, on external financing with capital inflows from other countries, including elsewhere in the euro. I stress we were focused on EMU's fiscal arrangements and what they might imply for Treasury's control of UK fiscal policy. The assessment saw the need for greater fiscal flexibility in EMU and looked at various fiscal options, from strengthening the automatic stabilisers through to new instruments such as a consumer credit tax. But our analysis was very focused on fiscal stabilisation through time within countries rather than stabilisation between countries which I want to come back to. As it turns out, since 2003, the UK economy has actually become more cyclically convergent in terms of growth rates with the euro area average. Here's a chart updated from the assessment. But this largely reflects the degree of global convergence in the upswing and the synchronised subsequent crash. And the euro area average masks some divergences between members, reflecting the forces that we did identify, such as credit. In terms of the growth and investment tests, I think the assessment was appropriately balanced in emphasising the potential macro benefits that would come from enhanced micro in integration between highly convergent and flexible economies. In practice, the evidence suggests that the UK has seen its trade share with the euro area decline, although it remains high. On the investment test, we didn't really explore what would happen if the credit channel for monetary policy became more and more impaired, as has happened in the UK since the financial crisis, and is apparent in the fragmentation of euro credit markets. One of the biggest issues we didn't do justice to was whether euro membership was permanent or was an arrangement that a country could leave. This wasn't a failure of imagination. Rather, it was a conditioning assumption of the whole analytical and policy approach to EMU by the whole of the EU. And it, e and it was informed by the UK's more general stance to the euro from its first inception, wanting it to be a success. So like everyone else, we assumed it was permanent. 
A related limitation in our assessment was the role of fiscal policy and whether EMU implied a fiscal union. The fiscal policy framework in the euro area was, and to a large extent still is, materially different from that of the US, which we'd studied. In the euro area, fiscal policy is largely set at the national level with minimal fiscal transfers between countries. And that contrasts with the US, where the federal government can coordinate fiscal transfers. The, U the EU treaty includes specific provisions of so-called no bailout conditions that underline national governments were fully responsible for ensuring that their own fiscal positions were sustainable. There was a range of views about whether this would last, and some ag academics submitted evidence to us, backed up by, um, by their analysis of the US, and the inter-regional fiscal transfers were essential to long-term viability of EMU. By, our co by contrast, our assessment reached the strong conclusion that a federal fiscal policy was neither necessary nor desirable in EMU, which was much too sanguine, completely underestimating the speed with which governments could lose access to the bond markets. This is the earlier bond yields chart updated for the subsequent 10 years and hence underestimated the need for last resort financing. The Treasury has since recognised this in our approach to the policy needs for EMU to now be a success and also in the analysis we are doing on the issues facing Scotland if it were to leave the UK. It would take at least another whole talk to do justice to what we've learned about the subject of the city test and the role of the financial sector. We presented an original application of clustering analysis and drew on the historical work of David Kiniston to understand the roots of the UK financial sector's strengths. But we didn't foresee the build-up in the risks of the financial sector. Here proxied by its increase in size as a share of GDP post-2003. More importantly, we didn't see the risks represented by the increasing size of the financial sector balance sheet and the limitations of the UK's financial stability policy framework. We didn't completely ignore the issues, but we certainly didn't give them anything like the consideration they deserved, as evidenced by the fact the assessment only had one short factual paragraph on financial stability out of 250 pages. The experience of several countries in the Euro periphery, and indeed the UK, has shown the close relationship and risk of an adverse feedback loop between a large financial sector and the state's balance sheet and finances. Another related em emission was the failure to focus on balance sheets more generally, and in particular the risks of indebtedness in the private and public sectors. This is surprising given our focus on housing credit, and also given the Maastricht Treaty's initial emphasis on public debt. To complete the list of emissions, Underlying all of this, we were insufficiently challenging about the resilience of the UK macro framework, and particularly the fiscal framework. In the light of what I've already said, I can quickly cover the successes of process and how they're reinforced in today's Treasury. We delivered a major logistical exercise in time. It's one of the myths of Whitehall that the Treasury can't do delivery. In the Treasury of today, there are fewer all-nighters, at least of the planned variety, with the budget and autumn statement and indeed spending round text now locked down during the hours of daylight. And we did this on the basis of a project plan which followed best practice tenets. The Treasury also showed it could invest in staff, building up a breadth and depth and capability on the euro. We invested in institutional memory and knowledge transfer. And although staff turnover has been a problem in recent years, we've retained sufficient capacity to inform our work on the financial crisis and more recently on Scotland. Treasury showed flexibility in its use and deployment of staff, cutting through lines of command and directorate boundaries. The Agile Workforce Report, published yesterday, cites the Treasury's current approach to organising itself as an example of best practice. Our degree of engagement with the academic community was unprecedented and would surprise many given perceptions of the Treasury and the sensitivity of the issues. Simon Wren Lewis told, tell, told me recently that he likes to give the EMU work as a best practice example of how government and academia should interact. In that sense, we were years ahead of civil service reform's current emphasis on open and contestable policy making. A fair challenge is whether we should have involved the rest of Whitehall more. more. I think we were able to cover all the relative issues effectively, but no doubt we would have benefited. We did engage with the bank at some length on the inflation target switch. Related to this, should we have engaged even more with the countries which had joined the Euro to understand more what they were doing and why? 
If we had, could the roadshow have got more traction and could that have contributed to subsequent developments? But as it was, John Cunliffe and Sue, Sue, Sue Owen led a pretty full-on engagement through the EFC and bilaterally. Another what-if, well beyond the scope of this talk, which some still like to talk of, is to consider what might have changed about the performance of EMU and its management if we'd been a member from the outset. The, the assessment was the Treasury's work, but the question is often posed whether we came under political pressure in producing it. Ed Balls was very engaged at every stage, but I never felt under pressure. And Gordon Brown was very careful to keep at one remove throughout. My positive work experience was in line with Andrew Turnbull's remarks in a speech in 2002 quoted by Robert Peston. The Treasury was inherently cautious on currency choices which aligned our institutional incentives to those of our, of our political leaders. But I have tried, but as I've tried to set out, I think officials were open-minded in our analysis with a pluralistic approach. So I don't think the five tests were window dressing. For me, the approach was consistent with the axiom officials advise and ministers decide. S Stephen Walls and Robert Peston's conclusions are relevant here. I'll just read the final one. However, the man in the white coat, Ramsden, and the Treasury team were right. This was the wrong mo moment to participate in monetary union. So it's possible to view the process as a vindication and rehabilitation of the Whitehall machine and the Mandarin class. For the only time since 1997, a momentous decision was taken in the old-fashioned way of civil servants doing a serious piece of work which was subsequently adopted by ministers. Of course, this is an oversimplified view, but I've taken out all his caveats. As you... I'll, settle, I'll settle for that, but P Peston's conclusion is from early 2005. Events since pose a significant challenge to what the Treasury does and how we do it, and I want to conclude with some thoughts. The approach to the five tests still resonates. Rigorous and intensive analysis, extensive planning, open engagement with external experts, cross-cutting teams, flexible working. These are all fundamental to successful policy making and to a successful Treasury. Of course, the Treasury has had to deal with even more challenging issues since 2003. We've sought to learn the lessons of the financial crisis, including building up financial sector expertise and strengthening our approach to handling risk. We've outsourced the economic forecasting function to the OBR, which is much more open and transparent in its work than we ever were. We've drafted in expertise on a temporary basis, such as John Llewellyn and John Fingleton, and also into the executive team with the recent arrival of Charles Roxburgh from McKinsey. And we focused our efforts on economic and fiscal scenarios work rather than fine-tuning forecasts to tell stories and to better frame the uncertainties and risks. Ultimately, I think the Treasury did a good job on the UK decision on EMU due to a lot of very hard work by a lot of incredibly committed staff, many of whom are here tonight. It's a cliche but true that the Treasury staff are its main asset and they are highly valued. The Treasury's Executive Management Board is acutely conscious of the need to support them in what they achieve and to try and safeguard their well-being, including a better work-life balance than we manage with the EMU work. Currency questions remain of key interest for the Treasury. We're playing a leading role in the cross-Whitehall work to inform the September 2014 referendum of the Scottish people on whether to stay in the UK monetary, fiscal and political union. The Scotland Analysis Programme, which has published three hefty tomes to date on legal currency and financial sector issues, has some similarities to the preliminary and technical work on EMU. As a postscript, the negotiations to form the current coalition government in May 2010 took place as the Greek Christ debt crisis took hold. The government ruled out joining EMU for the duration of the Parliament to 2015. The role of the five tests was over. The Chancellor announced in, June 20, in his June 2010 budget speech that the last Treasury staff member working on Euro preparations was being redeployed. But the Treasury's wider work goes on. Thank you.
Thank you very much indeed. Um, I wonder what it is about the Treasury and taxes. Uh, I seem to recall the Department of Economic Affairs was uh, agreed by George Brown and Harold Wilson in the back of the taxi. Um, anyway, um, we have probably about half an hour of questions. If you could uh, identify yourself and uh, mention any affiliation, that would be helpful. Who's first? We wowed them, Dave. Down the front over here, David. Uh, yes, uh, David Marsh from OMPFIF. No, thank you, Dave. That was a brilliant analysis. And uh, my first reflection would be that it deserves to be written up in French and German and uh, pieces <laughs> of it. And to, to, uh, it's a serious point. I think it does need to be uh, actually distributed uh, abroad. I really do. In the, the, the highlights, I think it would have a big impact. You, you mentioned that you didn't look at the balance of payments implications quite so much as the uh, implications for, say, credit flows and also for competitiveness. You clearly did put your finger on some of the things that have subsequently gone wrong. Uh, what about the whole issue of banking union? We, we know that um, many people did think that EMU would lead to asset bubbles, would lead to a lot of financial flows going untrammeled across boundaries, would lead to banks getting into difficulties, and there was never any thought about how to cope with that. Um, and we know from the Delors Committee that, in fact, this was thought about then, and the Germans struck out any idea of combining supervision and monetary policy as being somehow a, uh, a contradiction in terms. Did you put uh, your finger on, on that particular point, which, of course, has certainly come back to haunt us in the last uh, few years? Um, no, we didn't. Um, we did. It's fair to say that in our some of our internal thinking, we did challenge ourselves on, on both our belief that um, you didn't need um, fiscal and, 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 and moves towards political union, which, which banking union would obviously also be part of. Um, but we, we came back to a, a pretty monolithic view that um, this could be this could be all achieved through member states focusing on what was in their own best interests. And I think that was, you know, that was the big... I, I listed many of, the, many of the areas where we didn't develop that analysis, including in banking union. And I think that, you know, with the benefit of 10 years of hindsight, um, we and, and a lot of other people missed that. Um, and... It's fair to say that well, there were an, another five tests or similar assessment to be done, it would probably have to be even more complex <laughs> given, given those kind of issues. Um, Russ Reed from the School of Economic and Finance, uh, Green Mary. Um, I was interested you had made a passing comment about uh, the impact of exchange rate movements on the economy in the sense that I think the recent experience is, has been sort of surprising. It's, we've had a significant, really, exchange rate depreciation and it seems to have had very little effect. Would that actually cause you to revise your view of the importance of exchange rate flexibility um, given what we've experienced? Uh, I mean, we, it, again, if we were doing a, another assessment, we would, we would revisit all our assumptions and we, you know, our models um, were set up to, to tell stories about the economy. They, you know, we calibrated them on pretty conventional assumptions about the impact of the exchange rate. Um, and I think we would revisit, we would revis revisit that. I mean, this is a classic area where you talk about, you know, that there are long lags and it, it may be that some of those impacts are still to come through, but I mean, I've, not sure if Ian, who's here from the MPC, has given a, a speech on this recently, but we certainly had speeches from Charlie Bean and I think, Mar I think Martin Wheel talking about what, you know, whether, whether we're still waiting for the exchange rate impact to come through. But I mean, I think we've, we've noticed in, um, in our analysis um, the impact of higher inflation um, associated with the depreciation on real income. So, we, yeah, we would, we, we would, I mean, we, in a sense, we revisit it in the scenarios work that we now do to inform government, current government policy, and we would if we were looking again at the euro. 
in the middle over here, please. Hi, um, Christine Woodrow um, from Treasury. I remember at the time um, a lot of, of discussion on the radio in relation to our pension fund assets in the UK, and that would prevent us joining the uh, um, uh, EMU. Do, did that form any part of your analysis? I, I guess I'm looking at some of my colleagues now. I think really only in terms of thinking about how the transmission mechanism through, you know, from the impact of monetary policy through to onto the real economy might be impacted by these different, you know, these different patterns of asset and liabilities. But I don't think we particularly looked at that issue, no. Or if we did, it's a study I've forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Over here on the, on the end there, that's right. Guy Falkenbridge, Reuters. Um, Thanks for an interesting talk. Um, the current obsession seems to be not so much whether we're going to join the euro, but um, whether we're going to leave the European Union. I just wondered, uh, has the Treasury done any sort of research on, on what the impact of that might be on our economy? And um, if so, could you share the sort of key points? <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is the first time I've spoken in public about the euro, um, 10 years on from the decision. So. Uh, I think I'll probably uh, uh, take that line of defence. Um, what I would say is that um, a lot of the um, a lot of the analytical building blocks are, you know, I think are, are potentially relevant on um, the you know the, the impact of greater or lesser integration on invest on investment, particularly on foreign direct investment. So all the things that appear in the debate um, in the UK, um, you know, we, we and others across the civil service have the capability to analyse those. Actually, the big thing we're focusing on at the moment, as I mentioned, is Scotland, where we're bringing to bear all that kind of analytical armoury. Sorry for such a... It's like being in front of the Treasury Select Committee. <laughs> Please, down the front here. Thanks very much, John Llewellyn from Llewellyn Consulting. Dave, this is, this is a tough question to ask, but you're the only person who could answer it. And I just wondered if you'd take a stab at it. <laughs> and that is, given, how ma given those volumes that you produce, of course, you can't know the answer, but do you think that if those tests have been carried out on any of the 11 countries that did join, any pair of them would have been judged fit to join? <laughs> in other words, is it intrinsic in the tests that the answer is going to be no, there's at least something that gets in the way? Or is it intrinsic in the tests that some of, some of the countries could conceivably have been deemed fit to join? Um, I don't think there is... I, I, I don't think the, the tests are intrinsically set up to be failed. I said that clear and unambiguous was a, was a high hurdle. In, in the way I approached it for the UK, I had a, I mean, I had a really open mind, a genuinely open mind up until early, early 2003. Um, I mean, people like Robert Peston say that it was clear that the you know, from the summer of 2002, the Treasury was, um, was coming out against it. But it was really the analysis of adjustment and the flexibility test, the cons for the UK... Of, of adjustment within EMU, some of the what-if pictures I showed that were kind of the clincher for me then. Um, so I think, I mean, I think that, you know, that there were, there, were, there are um, sizes of EMU that are, are perfectly viable and can be made to work. I mean, the subsequent experience has shown since that it requires greater union, greater banking union, greater um, fiscal... Um, commitments to other member states and we you know we've seen that play out but i know i think it's you can certainly think of of groupings i mean they would all involve germany um which i think um really benefit has really benefited from emu membership um and um and you would build up from that and i i think a, a big a big euro with the right um, institutions is perfectly viable and and 
can be a success and that's kind of what they're moving towards with the, the policies and the changes that are now happening. So I don't. So it's certainly not that it was, it was ruled out. Please, Andrew Turnbull. What I'm struck by, Dave, is how much of the analysis was about whether we were good enough to join, and it was about our deficiencies and lack of flexibility, etc. Not whether there were inherent defects in this model. The Groucho Marx question, was it a club that we would actually want to join, even if our economy had been stronger? <laughs> if you're writing that now, I think you'd have written a completely different piece. Now, how far did you anticipate that it could go as badly wrong as it, as it did? And but also, was there any point in, say, 2007 when you thought, maybe these guys aren't doing so badly after all? <laughs> I'm trying to think if one of my charts uh, does that. Um, the, uh, I mean, we did. There was a kind. There was a, a stance that was one, which I tried to bring out in my talk, which was wanting uh, and working towards the euro being a, a success. And I think that probably did constrain us, and it did cert and it constrained some of the original members in in asking very challenging questions about some alternative routes to success. So, um, you know, in a sense, we, we were, the environment we were working in, including the politics, meant that we probably didn't go off in terms of what we published into all kinds of different scenarios of, of different types of, of, you know, policy framework for the euro. And, and as you say, if we were to do an assessment now, it would be completely... Um, it, you know, we'd have to address all those issues. I'm just thinking of 2007. Um, would we have... I, I think you would... I, I'm not sure you would think in 2007 whether you should join the euro, but certainly given, sorry, what happened with growth in subsequently, you might think, you know, we, you know I think we, we, like a lot of institutions, need to challenge ourselves on... Shouldn't we have built up more resilience in our policy frameworks? You know, this is not just true of national governments and national institutions. People like the IMF, you know, we just didn't see it coming. So I think that would have been where I would have uh, been looking to focus my efforts rather than on whether we should have joined, uh, joined the, the uh, euro at that point. And I guess the indebtedness chart that I didn't show is also really... I mean, we're the... We're the bottom line going up to join Japan. That was, that was pretty striking how that took off from, from 2003. And I think, you know, again, the extent, you know, the amount of time we were spending on 2007 on, on that rising indebtedness probably didn't do justice to the, to the issue. Other questions? Oh, dear, that's pro provoked a lot of questions. That's a bad <laughs> sign. Evan, Evan Davis from the BBC. I'm... We've spoken the whole time as though the UK is just one economy, a sort of a single entity. Of course, the interesting thing that's happened outside is that we've seen a kind of marked divergence in the performance of London and the South East, which has got one kind of economy and one sort of business model, and the, particularly the north of England, which has, I think, suffered rather badly um, outside EMEA. I wonder whether you did much analysis of what the kind of you like the distribution of power economic power and influence within the uk is inside and outside the euro at the time of the five tests and whether looking back on it the correct assessment would have been that the north of england should have joined and the south of england should have stayed outside that the north <laughs> passes the five tests well in <laughs> i mean i mean one of the one of the great virtues of the five tests was it, it was like a kind of Christmas tree that we could hang ever more bits of analysis on. And, and again, with the benefit of hindsight, I think we should have looked more, not just through the lens of the five tests, but in our analysis more generally on what was happening to regional developments. Actually, Alison Cottrell, who's sitting over there um, and had recently joined the Treasury in, uh, in 2003, we, we did a huge study on sectors and I think in that and in one of the other studies, we started to get into some of the regional questions, but we didn't see the financial sector 
exploding in the you know build growing in size in the way that it did subsequently you know doubling as a share of GDP as another chart showed um, and you know ta overtaking manufacturing what's interesting though what I think and where we are doing justice to these issues is actually in the work on Scotland where we are looking at a really uh, you know significant re you know, nation within the UK and we're actually revisiting quite a lot of the analysis the stuff we've so far published is on um, is more on the macro issues around currency choices but you know we're looking more at the the micro economic issues and what they imply I mean I think a variant of your question which um, Nick McPherson was um, challenging me on was whether you know this, whether a bit of the UK should be in monetary union with the US <laughs> so and that's a, that's another version there was a question over here Hi, Dave. Uh, good talk. Thank you. Um, Lee Folger, I used to be in the EMU team uh, 10 years ago, um, and I was involved in the roadshow as well that Dave uh, trailed a number of times. Um, my question really relates to the reactions of some of the member states on the roadshow. I think we presented the, the analysis, and it was very comprehensive and rigorous, as David said, um, and of course they totally accepted the analysis, and there's a question Mr. Llewellyn raised earlier around the, the, whether the five tests were too high a hurdle. But also some of the reactions that we had were, um, you know, but what you haven't got is the political test, is the what are the non-economic benefits. You've taken a purely sort of mercenary decision to, to joining the euro, which personally I think was probably not a bad idea at the time given what's happened now. But I just wondered if we had have had to include a political test, how would we have framed that into the analysis? <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, I... I I consciously steer clear of the politics throughout, ap apart from a, a reference, and I, I will continue to do so. But I think it comes back to um, uh, the earlier question about you know the UK's position in the EU. It's a it's a it's a consistent it's a consistent theme, and in the EMU decision, the politics obviously did play a you know did play a part as um, the Stephen Wall. Um, Quote and, uh, and you know Stephen Moore's book is, is 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 really is really good exposition on the on on the wider politics of the UK and the EU. So um, I'm not going to answer your your question, <laughs> and I can't answer I can't ask you to either. Sadly, Ian. <laughs> question down the front. Nick McPherson from actually visiting professor at Queen Mary, I should say. <laughs> um, but also from, from the Treasury. First, I just want to make a clarification. I wasn't suggesting we should enter a monetary union with uh, the United States. I was just noting that the British yield curve uh, today was almost identical to that of the United States, which I thought was um, kind of interesting. Um, two, two questions. I mean, the first more of a statement than a question, but I'll try and pose it as a question. Um, my sense back in 1997 uh, was that uh, Mr. Brown was more positive about uh, joining the single currency than uh, Mr. Blair. Um, and that actually what changed it, I, th I think Ed Balls was always more anti it than Brown, but what really, I mean, and, and the, one of the reasons why any self-respecting Labour Chancellor would be interested in some fixed currency arrangement is that all the previous Labour governments um, ended up with either an exchange rate crisis or a funding crisis. So this was a really good anchor. And it was only actually with the success of the Bank of England uh, independence that it, it became clear that there was an alternative way. So I'd be interested in your views on that. My, my second question is more um, related to the Treasury institutionally. Do you think that there is something intrinsic about the Treasury which always makes it slightly more anti-European uh, than, say, the Foreign Office um, or, or indeed Number 10? And um, if, that, if you do think that, uh, why is it? <laughs> it's, like, it's like the mirror image of Lee's question. It's like one from one side and one from the other. Um, on, on the first... I mean... I'm, I'm going to play the kind of uh, 
uh, civil servants uh, line of defence on the first one. I mean, you were, you were the Chancellor's principal private secretary <laughs> uh, in 1997 in the handover from Ken Clark to uh, Gordon Brown. I mean, the fact that I met Charlie Whelan, int you know, introduced by Sam Beckett uh, uh, for the first time in the uh, Red Lion in, um, on October the 17th, 1997, shows you how far adrift I was from the, uh, <laughs> the political centre of the Treasury. So, I mean, I kind of, uh, uh, I, I defer to you on uh, where Brown and Blair were. Um, on the second point, I don't agree that the Treasury is, in, is inherently anti-European. I, I mean, I, I, I believe what I, I wrote in my talk, and, and I actually think that the Treasury consistently, from all my sort of sentient time as a, as a Treasury official, which I probably date from about 1991 or so, because before that I was just kind of... I joined the Treasury in 1988 and was you know, just a bit in awe of the place. But once I started to think about it, I always thought the Treasury was incredibly engaged um, on, on the EU and on making the euro a success. There was a range of views. There were, you know, there were people in the senior management team who you knew were sceptical. There were people who were just incredibly practical and people, you know, like Nigel Wicks about just kind of getting things done. You know, people like Jonathan... Um, you know, who went to work in, in the EU. I, I don't, um, don't recognise this idea. I think what, what I tried to say in my talk was that we were sceptical about currency, and I think that was true. Um, and that was then reinforced... I think the ERM experience was, 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 was absolutely shocking for the Treasury from, from top to bottom, and, and you know, the, the, the Peston book gives various accounts of that, as does Philip Stevens' book. I think it really, really changed the Treasury and the 1992 uh, start of moving towards getting control of our own monetary circumstances, I think, w was really powerful and really effective. And then, as you say, by 1997, we did, the, uh, we did the independence of the Bank of England, which reinforced that. So I think we were, we were moving away from these currency um, but, you know, being supportive of these currency decisions, but I never felt that the Treasury is more, you know, more negative about Europe or than Number Ten or the FCO. But maybe I'm just very, very naive. But uh, I'll stand by that. <laughs> I'll, stand, I'll certainly stand by being naive in this world. Oh, there's Chris Charles. <laughs> <laughs> We've got five minutes, so let's have, if we can, as many questions as possible. Okay. Them all at once okay. or, or quick farming? You are quick. You can, but, you call, you can say prolix at this point. That no. was a long answer. No, 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 no. I won't say that. Uh, okay, okay, please, down here. Who's it again? Down here? No, there, was, there was a... Yeah, no, was, yeah, it, no, there's one, not there. You can't avoid Chris Giles. He's, he's, we, will, we will in just a second. Just here, just here, just here. Just here. Oh, um, Dave, in one sense, your conclusions on the convergence test were perhaps not surprising in the sense that convergence between two large and diverse economies such as the UK and Germany by accident would be quite an unusual uh, set of affairs. Um, I just wonder, and I do remember thinking at the time, uh, if you're going to promote convergence, you're going to need either a set of government policies that actually drive convergence forward, or you need some form of currency discipline, such as the RM, to automatically force convergence through an economy, as we saw for the previous decade for many of the eventual members. I just wonder, in that regard, did you ever think about publishing an appendix saying what the UK would need to do uh, in terms of government policy to get itself ready for uh, European uh, membership? What we did was this, the, all this um, work that led to lots of sections of the assessment around the policy requirements that would encourage, uh, make it more likely that over time we would meet the test. So the move to the HICP inflation target was meant to be our equivalent in the, in the kind of policy instruments that we were then using of, the, of something like the ERM, although obviously it was not... It was not nearly as constraining, but you know those policy requirements. As I said, they were all they all made sense for the UK in their own right. There were things like planning reform, and you know we set up the the Barker review, things like potential reforms to the way that um, you know more more longer term financing of of UK houses. You know that wouldn't put our trans 
mission mechanism more in line with the German one, so you move to more fixed rate mortgages. Um, but we never, we, we never kind of completed the circle on that and said we will, you know, we, these things will definitely have this effect and we'll judge them in that way. We, it, was, it, was, it was softer than that, which led to all the, the newspaper quotes I showed that you could kind of read, read what you liked into it. Some people could see that it might be taking us towards a possible passing of the test in a year or two's time, or for other people, and that's how it turned out because various other things came in. You know, the, 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 the possible membership was pushed away. But we, we, by that stage, we, never, we weren't in the, in the position of, of trying to systematically make it happen, and there weren't people pushing us to do that. To, so the policy stuff was always quite light. Please. Chris Giles from the Financial Times. Dave, thanks very much for a really interesting talk and effectively showing in lots of ways just how thorough and effective the five tests uh, process was. Your chart, a, little, a few earlier than this, unfortunately also shows that even though counterfactuals are extraordinarily difficult, Britain's relative economic performance to the Eurozone has deteriorated since the five tests. We were better than them and now we're no better than them. Um, so the question, I suppose, which is Phil Stevens' point, is um, why has economic policy been so brilliant in, um, in Britain since? Or I suppose the more, the more effective question is, the, the serious question, is what, is it about, what was it about the five test process that worked so well, whereas the rest of British uh, analysis of our economic situation at the time worked so badly? That's definitely a subject for another talk. Um, I mean, I did stress, you know, to, to the, the first way you frame the question, um, that, you know, there, there were lessons to learn from our, from our you know, the stewardship of the UK macro framework, monetary, particularly, I mean, monetary, we've, you know, we've, we've looked again at the monetary policy framework in, in the light of the crisis, published our our review of that with Budget 2013 and uh, you know, the MPC are, are looking at the issues that, we, that we've, we've, we've suggested they look at. Fiscal policy, I think, you know, big challenges to the way we run, we ran fiscal policy and you know, that, that comes on to this, you know, apart, you know, this debt chart and why, why debt's doing that. And I did stress the yeah, you know, the shortcomings in our and in the way we approached um, financial um, stability and macro financial policy in particular. And I think you know you do have to. Um, the UK does have to keep, and the Treasury we have to keep challenging ourselves on the on the way we we do policy. I said we were good at. Um, you know, we we become quite cautious on. On, on currency choices, and I think we were, we were effective, and, and you were suggesting we were effective in the outcome on this, but that's quite a reactive thing. And, you know, are we as good at developing our own frameworks um, you know, when, when we're not under a challenge to make a decision to join something? And you know, that's something that Philip Stevens and you and others will keep, keep challenging us on. You know, we have these external prompts to do assessments, but how do, how do we, how do we uh, raise our our growth performance, you know, that's something that the current government is, is grappling with too. Was there a question? There was one here. Yes. Right in the middle. That's it. Peter Barnes from Cleveland Associates. Um, I was working for The Economist in the period immediately after 1997. And the impression I had then was that the process of Britain participating in the five economic tests and um, the uncertainty about whether we would join the euro or not was actually itself beneficial in uh, what Britain could get out of um, our EU partners in terms of negotiations because they had an added incentive to, to keep us sweet. I realize it's going a bit beyond your day-to-day uh, -day responsibilities at the time, but I wondered if you had any observations on that point. Well, 
I guess that what, I w what I would say is it comes back to this kind of positive stance that I think the Treasury had to engagement. And part of that, one of the motivations for that, was to want to be um, in, you know, not just in the room influencing these things, but seeing that it was in, you know, this was going to be our major trading partner, whether it had four members or 11 members, we're going to do more trade with it than we were going to do with the, um, with the US. So it's in our interest that it worked. And I can see that also, we, you know, we, we, you know, I, I, I wonder where, whether we would have got some of the influence that we had, for example, um, um, on the development of, of policies um, that were kind of negotiated in the Monetary Policy Committee, sorry, the Monetary Committee that Sue attended and the EFC if we weren't seen as very active and engaged partners. So I think there is something, there is something in that. Um, and you know, that obviously then plays into the debate on, on our, our membership of the EU now and you know, the big policy, you know, trying to get an, things like an EU-US trade agreement that would be incredibly um, beneficial to the UK's um, performance as a very open economy, you know, particularly on things like services, where we've got huge amounts potentially to, to gain. So I think, yeah, there, there, is a, there is a positive feedback there. And so brings to an end the Myling Group 98. The apologies to those still wishing to ask questions. Uh, the 99th meeting of the Myling Group will take place on the 16th of July when Charles Moore will be in conversation with Peter Hennessy talking about Thatcher and Whitehall. Um, all that's left for me to say is I thought that was quite something. Oh, it was a wonderful lecture, excellent questions. Dave Ramsden, thank you very much. Out.